me aorta grounds. Um, uh, today, uh, we have the great pleasure of being um, to have Dr. Eric Herget uh, giving a talk. Dr. Eric Herget is one of our interventional radiologists. He is a co-director of the aortic, uh, aortic team or the aortic program, and um, he has been um, uh, a lead on uh, imaging surveillance and endovascular therapies, uh, specifically here at the Foothills Hospital for many, many years. And, and more recently in our efforts to uh, merge and, and have more of a, a citywide approach uh, with all the hospitals and all the specialties. Um, so uh, I will pass it off to Dr. Herget and he's gonna give his talk on managing false lumen flow uh, in aortic dissections. Eric? Okay, thanks Scott. Yeah, so um, I thought I would go through and just sort of share the, um, the lessons that, uh, that I've learned and that I think that in medicine we've been learning over the past uh, 15 or 20 years in, in the management of, uh, of aortic dissection and these false lumen challenges. Um, there's a great, great quote from Stephen Hawking, doing a job right the first time gets the job done, doing the job wrong 14 times gets you job security. So I don't think we're doing the job wrong, but we definitely are learning. And often with aortic dissection, once the patient makes it through the acute phase, we're left with this complex puzzle of how the false lumen is being pressurized, how the flow is getting in, how it's getting out, how that all interacts together. And it's complicated. And it has been an evolution and an iteration in how we've progressed in understanding this and managing these uh, complex flow patterns. So I just wanted to kind of go through and share our experience or my experience over the last uh, uh, time that I've been in Calgary. So we'll kind of follow this as an outline and talk a little bit first about um, hemiarch. It's not a perfect flow uh, diagram because you know there's we're talking about acute type A and type B dissections and you know their management is a little bit different, but in type A dissection, uh, hemiarch open surgical repair is the bedrock of, uh, of uh, repair for this condition. In the acute phase, it's very robust in addressing the, the pathologies that cause acute mortality. That's rupture, tamponade, insufficiency, and it does very good at those uh, facets of the condition, but it does not address malperfusion very robustly. Um, also, it does not confidently address false lumen flow and very frequently they are left with persistent anti-grade false lumen flow, which is why many of these patients go on to develop progressive false lumen aneurysmal degeneration. So this is a, a picture of a, a very typical type A, the image on the left is uh, a very typical picture of an acute type A dissection, the enlarged ascending aorta, the collapsed true lumen. And if you look at the caliber of the descending um, aorta, you can see the relative size of the true and false lumen. A year later, after they had a standard hemiarch repair, you can see how the, the lumens in the descending have changed. The true lumen remains effaced and small, and the false lumen has already started to enlarge and, and increase in size. These patients um, with the hemi following a hemiarch repair almost invariably are left with a new intimal tear at the distal anastomotic line. This picture here on the left illustrates the typical location of that. It's actually fairly unusual not to see this type of a, a new fenestration. And as a result, they're left with antegrade flow into that false lumen. And because they also have typically have fenestrations or communications between the two, two lumens in the visceral segment, they have a flow circuit and you get this partially thrombosed false lumen that's prone to aneurysmal dilatation. And most typically that aneurysmal degeneration is typically in this location up here. One of the other weaknesses or drawbacks of the simple hemiarch repair is that it's unable to address um, primary intimal tears that are located beyond the ascending aorta. Um, so this picture demonstrates one of these cases where you can see the intimal tears in the mid arch and this patient has developed uh, aneurysmal enlargement in the arch. 
um, a sort of a, a parallel thing to uh, hemiarch and, uh, is the development of TVAR or endovascular repair of uh, acute um, pathologies in the descending thoracic aorta. Dr. Dake, a, a physician I trained with down at Stanford, was the first to describe this in the thoracic aorta way back in the early 90s. And when you go through their paper, it's, it's a crude design back then and it's evolved a long way. There's a picture on the left of their original um, design. These were handmade, custom made for each patient. They even took the Dacron from the, uh, from the surgeons and cut it and hand ironed it to get the crimps out and hand sewed it on this thing. They, they uh, it's still a 24 French delivery system, but it was interesting. They, the, the device wasn't attached to anything like in the modern era. It was just pushed through the sheath with a Teflon pusher and you just had to unsheath it rapidly and hope that it stayed where you wanted it to. Things have evolved a long way since then. But as we've gained lots of experience over the decades since that time, we've learned some important lessons. And this was a, a large review um, from Journal of Vascular Surgery in 2019, looking at the outcomes of 55,000 patients in the US, comparing outcomes with uh, medical management, operative management, or TVAR. And, and we can see that in, in general terms, that the length of hospitalization with patients that are managed with TVAR, and, and again, these are primarily type B uh, patients, that they tended to have a shorter length of hospitalization and they tended to have less in hospital mortality. So there, there, were, there are advantages to TVAR compared to open repair, definitely in the setting of uh, uh, residual dissection. But one of the drawbacks of a simple TVAR is that there is often a high re-intervention rate. So, you know, it ranges uh, somewhere, you know, between 15 and 30%, that's not insignificant. And so that is a, a, a weakness of the simple T-bar approach that um, has been looked at and, and uh, ongoing work to try and find further refinements to see if that can be improved. One of the ways or one of the efforts to try and improve that was to meld or combine those two into one. And the hybrid extended repair is an approach uh, adopted by several centers uh, around the world in hopes of Im improving some of those uh, uh, deficiencies some of the benefits of a, a hybrid extended repair is that you can address not only uh, tears in the ascent in the aorta in the setting of acute type A dissection, but also address those tears that were beyond the, the confines of the hemiarch uh, uh, replacement. Um, this approach additionally potentially can address additional fenestrations that may be present in the proximal descending thoracic aorta. Typically with this approach, the stent graft that was deployed was not long. It was only 10 or 15 centimeters. And as such, it didn't encompass the entire descending thoracic aorta. Um, these these uh, stent grafts, when we first started doing these, were deployed in an anti-grade fashion while the chest was still open. Uh, I think uh, now the, the majority of times when it's done, it'll be done a, a few days later and come from the groin from a retrograde approach. The, the hybrid approach, approach does facilitate re-expansion of the distal true lumen, but I grade that out because it's not as robust as some of the uh, more further refinements that I'll talk about. It, it also, in some cases, definitely promotes false lumen obliteration when we look at the false lumen comprehensively, but again, not necessarily in as robust a manner as we would like. Obviously, the big hurdle to this approach um, is you need a dedicated dissection call team. You need uh, dedicated aortic surgeons on call 24 seven to, to follow this type of an approach. So here's that same patient with that uh, tear in the, in the mid arch that I showed earlier. And the picture on the left shows uh, their immediate post-operative imaging. You can see that the uh, aneurysmal false lumen in the arch has been successfully addressed. It's no longer pressurized and enhancing, but you still see that significant portion of the non-stented descending thoracic aorta that has persistent false lumen flow. It, it um, was enhancing coming all the way back up to here. Now, when we see it come all the way this far up, we think that there has to be some sort of an outlet um, 
And a year later, you can see there is still this um, false lumen flow. The, the false lumen has become progressively slightly larger. So as we look a little closer, we can see that this patient had a little intercostal outflow here. And the thinking was that this outflow was maintaining the circuit, so allowing the blood to enter into the false lumen from the abdomen and flow out like a circuit and out. And so here you can see another picture of that little intercostal. Again, these are a puzzle and we're always trying to figure out how we can solve that puzzle. When we decided to actually go and see if we can embolize that intercostal, it had spontaneously thrombosed on its own. So you can see side by side pictures. This level here is about down to here and this had thrombosed on its own. So you can see after our angiogram where we just took pictures, you can see that once that little intercostal thrombosed and the circuit was closed, that the false lumen did uh, appropriately remodel. Here you can see the, the initial post-operative images where that false lumen is enlarged and pressurized. And now the false lumen at the same level is entirely gone. So the, the hybrid approach does have its uses, but it's not always as robust as, as one would hope. One of the potential weaknesses of the hybrid repair, again, utilizing typically a short stent graft that ends somewhere in this region, is we would, in the delayed phase, so sometimes several years out, would see this uh, stent-induced new intimal tear. And here's a picture demonstrating that effect. So here's a, a picture of a, a patient post-hybrid repair with the termination of the stent graft at about this level. This was their immediate post-operative film. And then a year later, we can see that the pressure effect from this stent graft, again, these are night null devices that tend to want to uh, straighten out over time. They, they have a predetermined shape they want to, to find. And that pressure on the false lumen membrane uh, resulted in some erosion. And you've got a new little tear there. And again, this is then placing that false lumen to uh, pressurize flow and risk of enlargement. So the, the way these are managed is you have to re-intervene. So you have to go back and put another stent graft in. It's not a complicated procedure, but it is a redo procedure. And that's the, you know, if our goal is to try and fix these right the first time, then this is one of the potential flaws of the, um, the hybrid repair. So the other, the next thing I sort of want to evolve into is this concept of a stentless T-VAR. And I, I, I never liked this term, but it's, I can't think of a better term. And that's sort of the term, the term that is caught in the literature. And this is talking about fixing these false lumen flow patterns without using a large caliber aortic stent. So you use a variety of tools. Um, this is a, a, a vascular plug, a balloon expandable stent graft, a self-expanding stent graft. This is a coil. So we use these in a variety of ways to try and control flow patterns. And I'll show a few examples from this. So the first one uses one of these uh, balloon expandable stent grafts. So this was a, a patient that had a, a type A dissection repaired with a hemiarch and developed this progressive false lumen aneurysmal enlargement. So we had followed him for several years and this false lumen just kept getting bigger and bigger. And you can see how massive it is. And it's got this buffalo hump that just does not look nice, but the dilemma was that the enhancement in the false lumen came up from fenestrations we could see in the inferior aorta, uh, but it stopped right here and we never saw it enhance further up. And so we kind of puzzled why this kept getting bigger because typically in that scenario, if there's no outflow, the false lumen should thrombose somewhere down here. That's where we typically would see it. And so we scratched our heads and eventually obtained a dynamic MRA. And with a dynamic MRA, we inject them with gadolinium and then image them over and over and over many times. So we'll do it sometimes, you know, 15 times uh, to watch how that contrast progresses through the vascular system. And so early in the arterial phase, we can see that the true lumen is enhancing coming down. You can see how it's quite effaced. And we're starting to see false lumen enhancement down here. And as we follow in a more delayed fashion, we can see that the false lumen is enhancing further up and it comes around and there's this little slip of false lumen here and it actually went right up the innominate and there was a re-entry tear at the right common carotid. And so that's why we couldn't see this false lumen enhancement, 
And so then there was a you know, scratching of the heads to see how was the best way to fix this. When we looked at the carotids with ultrasound, we can see this enhanced, this uh, dual directional flow in the carotid, the, the false lumen and the true lumen here. And when we drew this out schematically, the premise was that, uh, or the hypothesis was, if we could stent this true lumen open here and brace it open, it should block the outflow from the false lumen. And if we can block the false lumen here, this should all thrombose and that false lumen should be protected from rupture. So here we're coming from the arm with this um, balloon expandable stent graft. You can see it being inflated at the level of the anominate. And once it was appropriately post dilated to its appropriate size, we could see immediately. So these were obtained on the table while the patient just had the stent graft immediately deployed, you can see immediately that the false lumen no longer has flow. The true lumen at the carotid has expanded in comparison to the immediate pre-deployment images. And when we look at this patient over time, that false lumen completely remodeled. You know, tr traditionally we consider, or we think that the false lumen is much less plastic in the chronic phase and much more malleable or remodelable, um, able to be remodeled in the acute phase. But in this patient, even though he was years out, we can see that it was quite remarkable, the degree of uh, false lumen resorption. And again, a side-by-side -side candy cane picture showing that remarkable false lumen resorption uh, related to just one stent graft. So another case looking at these vascular plugs, these come in different shapes and sizes. This is a type four plug, um, but they have different sizes and shapes. So this patient is one that we saw also had a remote hemiarch repair. You can see from a uh, type A dissection that developed this progressive false lumen aneurysmal enlargement, very typical location. And in this specific case, he had a couple of fenestrations in the proximal descending thoracic segment. And so the thought was, if we could occlude that inflow into the false lumen here, that should lessen the circuit and hopefully induce thrombosis down to maybe this level here and thereby protect this, uh, this area of, of pronounced enlargement. So these are challenging cases. This is uh, an, a picture from the angiogram. You can see with an eye of faith, all you can see really is the little end um, radiopaque markers, the actual device is very difficult to see. We have to angle the, um, the gantry, the camera, so that we're looking down the axis of the false lumen. So you can see I've got a catheter that's come up from the groin. We enter into the false lumen in the visceral segment. We're here in the false lumen. We've then probed and found that little hole in the, intima, in the uh, dissection flap and the catheter has gone through now into the true lumen. And this is the contrast in the true lumen and the false lumens over here. So this is after both devices have been deployed. Again, this is, uh, we don't see this much better in real time. So these are challenging, but they, I, I do think they have a role. And you can see that here side by side pictures, this was the, pre-embolization images and the post, you can see that the false lumen at the same level has uh, thrombosed and is getting smaller in size. Again, when it's with the side-by-side -side sagittal oblique, you can see that the false lumen is measurably smaller in comparison. And the uh, hypothesis was correct. The, the false lumen is thrombosed down to a lower level down to about here. Is it a perfect fix? No, but it is a, a, a tool in the toolbox. Um, Another case looking at the utilization of both of these. So this one utilized uh, a, a Viabon stent graft in combination with plugs. So this was another complicated patient that had um, a previous type A hemiarch repair that uh, developed false lumen complications, went on to have a hybrid repair and extension of stent grafts down to the uh, hiatus. Um, he also had a large intimal communication down in the inferior aorta that was addressed with placement of a stent graft in this location, but he had this residual segment of false lumen uh, uh, perfusion in the visceral segment of the upper abdominal aorta that just kept getting bigger and bigger. So initially we saw that there was a tear or a fenestration at the level of the renal artery. And so we placed stent grafts 
into the true lumen at the renal artery. And that's the, the Vibon stent graft, but that still didn't uh, completely address it. There was another tear right around here and a circuit of flow such that there was outflow from this lumbar artery. So we addressed this with a plug. And so you can see here, the catheters coming up from the groin in the true lumen. You can get a sense of how effaced the true lumen is at this level. And you can see some faint enhancement here. It's much easier to see this false lumen uh, enhancement on CT than angio, but there is enhancement here. So an image later on, I had this as a video, but of course the video is not gonna work, but you can see the plug is across the hole. And the way these plugs work is it's attached to a little delivery wire that once I get it uh, positioned in place to release it, I just unscrew this wire. And here's a subsequent picture from the angio. You can see immediately that true lumen is bigger. And when I do an angiogram, I saw no further enhancement in this false lumen. And as we look in follow-up, we can see the remarkable resorption. So there was still this intercostal that fills, but the actual false lumen that was aneurysmal and the actual false lumen flow is thrombosed completely. And that, that caliber uh, reduced significantly. And so if we can see uh, on a, a sagittal and an axial image, you can see the positioning of that plug. Um, the, the way they're positioned, the waist here is situated right at the level of the flap and that holds it in place in, in principle. Um, so just highlighting the use of these techniques. Now there are limitations. Um, this was a case that I showed earlier. So that standard appearance of a, a, a new intimal tear at the site of the distal hemiarch and astomotic line. Um, so the thought with this case was, can we plug this hole um, and address this, uh, this false lumen circuit? and plug that hole off. So here you can see we've come from the groin, we've got two, two catheters in place. So this pigtail is in the true lumen and this catheter has come up from the false lumen. We've navigated it through the, the, the intimal tear at the anastomotic line and positioned a larger plug. So this is a little different than this one. It has a, a much larger flange on either side of it but it's positioned appropriately. We can kind of feel it there in place. We, of course, we would never do this in the acute phase because the dissection membrane is too friable. So this is in more of a, a chronic phase when that flap becomes more, more firm and fibrotic. But that plug was positioned and within a few heartbeats of deployment, it was displaced and migrated distally. So it was pushed out of the false lumen by the, the flow and displaced into the true lumen. So we had to go in thankfully uh, pull that out with a snare um, without incident. Um, but we didn't give up. So we went back up into the false lumen and used coils to try and close this hole off. One of the difficulties with coiling uh, securely in this location is there's no backstop. So if there's flow that's coming into this region, it's pushing you into this aneurysm and the coils can um, get displaced and not stay where you intend them to. But in this case, we were able to get them to, to uh, form a pack in this location. And you really need to pack in a lot of coils in this setting to get a dense fill so that you can get occlusion of flow. But there is occasionally a role for this technique. You can see in follow-up that it was successful, that we were able to stop the flow into the false lumen. You can see the pre-embolization uh, picture showing this aneurysmal false lumen. And then in follow-up, we've seen this uh, stable uh, remodeling and progressive remodeling where that false lumen along the entire descending segment is thrombosed. So stentless TVAR, it's, uh, it's definitely a, a little bit of a tricky thing and finicky, but there is a role and um, it, it, uh, it definitely plays a role in the evolution of this false lumen management. A, a couple of the uh, further refinements that, again, encompass many of these things that I've already talked about are, uh, one of them is the petticoat technique. Um, you know, the petticoat, you can see these uh, old women's fashion with the brace under their dress to keep it uh, flared like this, but it's in its basic form, it's just addition of a bare metal stent in hopes of bracing open that true lumen. Uh, petticoat stands for provisional extension to induce complete attachment. And when we look at it schematically, uh, 
in the setting of a type B dissection or in a hybrid type A repair, the stent graft is deployed covering the primary intimal tear and the proximal descending segment. And then this bare metal stent is extended down into the uh, more distal aorta. One of the reasons for um, using a bare metal stent is that you're not covering those collateral vessels so that you're not placing the patient at an increased risk of spinal cord complications or uh, uh, visceral malperfusion. Again, just another uh, histopathologic schematic to um, demonstrate this. So the stent graft covers the inflow and then more distally, the stent graft, the uh, bare metal stent, uses just simple radial force to try and push this true lumen back and hopefully get relamination of the uh, uh, complete uh, aortic wall layers. And again, with this approach, at least, at least in its theoretical sense, you're not disrupting or fenestrating this uh, dissection membrane. You're just re trying to, to slowly force it back open without uh, fenestrating it. There have been uh, several case series looking at this, the largest of which uh, were the stable uh, trials. Stable one uh, looked at 40 patients from 10 centers. It's a rather heterogeneous uh, grouping of patients of acute and chronic. Um, but they did demonstrate that in general terms, they, with this approach, they did see a trend towards improved true lumen size when looking at the aorta comprehensively. And they did see a trend towards decreased false lumen size. But as a standalone, it's not a perfect fix because you can see that while they did accomplish very robust false lumen obliteration in the uh, segment of proximal aorta that was uh, stent grafted, along the segment of the dissection stent, they really had quite a high proportion of patients where the false lumen was only partially thrombosed. And uh, only about a third of the patients were able to realize complete thrombosis of that false lumen. Uh, stable two was uh, a, a little bit more of a refined look, looking only at acute uh, complicated type B patients, but somewhat similar outcome. They, they, um, they saw, again, fairly robust accomplishment of uh, complete false lumen thrombosis along the stent grafted segment, but along the dissection or bare metal stent, they only saw complete thrombosis in only about 18%. So, <clears throat> a couple of cases looking at our uh, local experience with this technique. So this was a patient that had an acute complicated type B dissection. You can see the true lumen is effaced and the false lumen remains in, is enhancing and, and, and enlarged. This patient's anatomy was tricky for a conventional T-bar, so they went for a, a hybrid arch repair. And you can see the immediate post-operative images while the um, uh, arch repair has addressed the false lumen along the stent grafted segment. And yes, this is the area that's most prone to false lumen complication in the long term. We have not addressed the false lumen distally. And you can see distal at the distal margin of the stent graft that we've created a large fenestration, not intentionally, but just that's what happened when this device was deployed. And uh, as a result, we've got fairly stable configuration of the uh, false lumen and the flap distally. And you can see looking further down that there is persistent complicated uh, configuration of the, the false lumen and the flap with resultant malperfusion, um, at least based on an imaging perspective. So in this patient, we further extended the stent graft to cover that intimal flap, that, that, that large fenestration and deployed this bare metal stent. So this was the first generation of that stent that was stainless steel deployed into the uh, infrarenal segment. And as we look at this patient side by side, the, uh, the pre-deployment images, we can see that the true lumen in the visceral segment is completely effaced. And the false lumen is very pressurized and quite large. And in this instance, the petticoat technique was quite successful. The, the uh, true lumen completely expanded. We were able to see complete relamination of the aortic walls and complete obliteration of the false lumen. In another case, this, this instance, a, an acute type A dissection, 
that also demonstrated, you can see here, true lumen is completely effaced. The false lumen is highly pressurized. And this patient also presented with features of uh, visceral malperfusion. So patient went for a hybrid uh, arch repair to address the acute type A dissection. And the stent graft extends into the proximal descending. And then this bare metal stent extends down to the uh, celiac region of the aorta. And in this instance, we can see that uh, weakness that I talked about. The, the membrane between the true and false lumen remains intact. The false lumen remains pressurized. And because typically the pressure, when these uh, false lumens remain pressurized and the membrane's intact, the pressure in the false lumen, it almost always is higher than the pressure in the true lumen. And as a result, the ra outward radial force of the bare metal stent is less than the pressurized false lumen. And as a result, this uh, stent is unable to open fully and we're unable to accomplish that relamination. There have been some, this is uh, just from a, a few months ago, I believe, uh, some additional efforts or thoughts to further evolve this petticoat approach. And uh, the authors have called this the expanded petticoat technique. It involves uh, initial placement of bare metal stents through the visceral segment, followed by placement of overlapping uh, stent grafts. They advocate stent, uh, distally extending it to somewhere about six to 10 centimeters above the uh, celiac. Um, and then additional placement of kissing iliac stents up in to, uh, just to the inferenal segment. And so again, we're seeing this further refinement and further evolution in hopes of not only addressing the acute phase of the disease, but addressing the false lumen comprehensively so that these patients aren't left with a pressurized false lumen and the need for numerous uh, re-interventions down the road. So the last two approaches that I wanna talk about are this Knickerbocker and Stabilize. They are similar to the petticoat, but slightly different. Um, the first I'll talk about is the Knickerbocker. Um, I'm not a golfer, but I can imagine this is high fashion on the golf course. These pants are Knickerbocker pants. And you can see this Knickerbocker approach um, is a, a, an endovascular fenestration technique combined with stent grafts. And so like the petticoat, there is a proximal stent graft to cover the primary intimal tear, in this case, in the setting of a, a type B dissection. But unlike a petticoat technique, with the Knickerbocker, you extend that stent graft right down to the supraceliac aorta. And following that, it, unlike the, the uh, petticoat, which relies just on the radial force of the stent, it, with this technique, you take a balloon and actually physically macerate or disrupt that uh, dissection membrane in hopes of fully opening the stent graft down here. So this is a cross section of a descending aorta. So when we size stent grafts for the distal landing zone, we'll sometimes just sort of fudge, you know, make a, a guesstimate of how big we can tolerate the, the true lumen to expand without creating a, a new intimal tear. But with the, with the Knickerbocker, you size the distal stent graft to the size of the overall aortic lumen. So as long as this overall aortic lumen is 42 millimeters or less, you can use this technique. And so here's the schematic showing where that stent graft has been balloon dilated. Uh, and as you do that, you can prevent false lumen flow that comes up from these visceral fenestrations. And once it hits this fully dilated segment, it can't get up and thereby you induce thrombosis into this segment of proximal aorta that's prone to the pronounced uh, dilatation. So here's a case demonstrating that. Uh, so this patient had a chronic complicated type B. Um, he had progressive false lumen an as aneurysmal enlargement. You can see from this schematic, here's the, the enlarged false lumen. Here's the primary intimal tear in the, in the uh, distal arch. This patient had an aberrant right subclavian that was embolized uh, preemptively. Um, the anatomy dictated that uh, the stent grafts needed to be landed in zone two, so he underwent a, uh, a left subclavian carotid transposition immediately prior to the stent grafts. But here you can see we've got 
<clears throat> overlapping stem grafts down the descending thoracic segment. And my video is not going to work, but you can trust me when I say the balloon here is inflating. And it's, it's uh, the first time it is a disconcerting thing to see when that balloon, you see it inflate. And these are compliant balloons. So they, you know, you give them more volume, they'll just get bigger and bigger until they rupture. And so this balloon molds into the confines of the stent graft. And then eventually the pressures are such that it disrupts the membrane and pops. And it's a disconcerting thing, but it, um, it, it is this approach. And you can see that in this case, side by side, you can see this stent graft has opened very nicely and we were able to open it up successfully. And you'll also note that we see no false lumen enhancement. And if we look on the uh, uh, axial images side by side, you can see that that false lumen is no longer receiving any enhancement. So it's remodeled appropriately. It's getting smaller. And in the uh, lower um, near the diaphragmatic hiatus, you can see again, the true lumen, which previously was partially effaced is now larger. The false lumen is completely gone. And so it was able to uh, successfully address this problem. So the stabilized technique is sort of a blend between the two, between the petticoat and the knickerbocker. But the stabilized technique has been getting some uh, uh, recent attention in the, the literature. And with the stabilized technique, you similarly deploy stent grafts somewhere between 10 to 15 centimeters above the celiac, the authors describe. And the purpose for that is to try and preserve as many collaterals to the spinal cord as you can to minimize the chances of uh, spinal cord malperfusion. So stent grafts are deployed to about that level. And then bare metal stents are deployed, overlapping the stent grafts down to the inferenal segment. And in addition to that, you utilize whatever else you need. So iliac stent grafts, if there are uh, reentry tears in the iliacs, you need to utilize stent grafts into the visceral branches if they are involved as they often are. And even if you need to do some of these uh, um, stentless T-VAR approaches with uh, plugs into some of these fenestrations. And so the goal is to be much more comprehensive in how that false lumen is being addressed. Once these uh, bare metal stents are deployed, this is the key difference and really the crux that's yet to be determined whether it's safe or not is balloon disruption of the dissection membrane is performed along the length of not just the stent grafted segment, but of the bare metal stent. And so you are disrupting that, that um, dissection membrane. And then the, 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 the thing that to, to, remains to be seen is, is that safe in a non-stent grafted segment of aorta? So those are sort of the pros is your, your, your less risk of spinal cord malperfusion compared to side by side with the Knickerbocker technique, but we need to determine if this is safe. Again, with the petticoat technique, you're not manually or physically disrupting this membrane, whereas with the balloon, we know that this is no longer intact. And so you're going to have flow into this space. And if that balloon also disrupts the adventitial layer, you're left with a problem. So some of the early experience with this, there was a, a, a paper from uh, this year, uh, the stabilized paper um, looked at the single center experience with 16 patients, kind of a heterogeneous collection, mostly acute uh, type A and B, but some chronic as well, pretty standard indications for intervention. And they actually had quite a, a, a good outcome with this. So. They had two deaths in their series. Neither of them were directly related to the stabilized technique. So, you know, a, a mortality rate not totally out of keeping with this patient population. But when we followed these patients over approximately 5.8 years, um, only one of the 13 patients required reintervention for a delayed endo leak in the uh, thoracic segment, I believe. And they had no delayed deaths beyond 30 days. They had no instances of aortic rupture. And they saw very robust reduction in false lumen size. So they saw false lumen uh, reduction in all except for their one endoleak patient. A another series, um, this was a, a single center series as well. 
looking at their experience with treating acute and subacute type B dissection, they performed the stabilized technique in 11 patients. They did have one instance of aortic rupture. It was in the abdominal segment. And I can imagine, they didn't describe this, but I can imagine they used one balloon to do the uh, um, uh, dissection membrane disruption. And perhaps that balloon was overinflated in the visceral segment. Um, so at the site of rupture, they were able to manage it with placement of a, um, a stent graft in the inferenal segment. So the patient did do okay with the, uh, the rupture, but they were able to see quite a robust uh, uh, obliteration of the false lumen. So in all of their stabilized patients, they saw complete obliteration of the false lumen along the thoracic and visceral uh, segments, and in all but two of their patients in the inferenal aortic segment. Another series from a few years ago. So this was, uh, I believe, also a single center series looking at their experience also with type B. They used the stabilized approach in 10 patients. They stent grafted down to the celiac, so a little bit more aggressive in their approach as compared with the more <coughs> the, the latest description, but they had no ruptures in their series of 10. They were the, another nuance that they described is they were not able to disrupt the membrane in all patients. So their approach, they inflated the balloon three times. And if the dissection stent did not completely open after three tries, they just left it. Um, they had no ruptures though. Um, they did a fair number, uh, required to do a fair number of uh, adjunctive endovascular procedures. So they visceral artery stenting in eight patients and also utilized iliac stents in a couple but they also were able to see complete obliteration of the false lumen in all 10 of their patients along the thoracic and visceral segments and in eight out of their 10 in the inferenal segments. So uh, interesting technique. And uh, it, again, this is all in evolution and we're understanding this more, but the, there is something I think to this uh, uh, Knickerbocker and, and stabilized approach. So I hope that's been interesting, um, but that sort of, uh, the talk for today, and I hope uh, hope you guys liked it. Eric, uh, fantastic uh, job, excellent talk, uh, and a really good overview of uh, the many tools in the toolbox, as you say, to fix a false lumen. Uh, it's gone far beyond just putting in a stent, and there's a lot more to it for sure. One thing I wanted to ask you, um, all the specialties to a varying degree have some uh, experience with endovascular stents, but in the realm of, you don't like the, you don't like the title, uh, a stentless T-bar, that's kind of more in the uh, lone radiology world. Um, so I, I'd like to ask you how, in your experience, how confident are you when you see a case that a stentless adjunct, whatever it may be, will, will be successful? Um, do you have a sense beforehand? And my second question is for for the clinician or surgeon that, that doesn't do that, such as us outside radiology, um, are there things that I can look at other than a, a connection to help me decide maybe I should, I should talk to IR about this or should we just, just throw them all at you and have you decide? Um, well, we, we've seen two failures with the stentless T-VAR and they both were with plugs that we tried to, or holes that we tried to close in the arch. And I, I'm, I would be reluctant to try again in the arch. I think that the angles in the arch are such that the, the uh, plugs didn't lay right. Um, so we were able to get them there and deploy them, but they were quite distorted as they conformed to the channels. Um, and so I think that predisposed them to perhaps Perhaps it was that, perhaps it was the higher pressures in that region, but whatever those reasons, we've, we had two that failed in the arch. The, the cases that I've done in the descending and abdominal aorta, they've, they've been fairly straightforward. They are tricky, but they've been straightforward and have worked uh, as intended. Um, so, Excellent. Uh, but no, knowing, knowing which cases are suitable for it, um, I don't know. I, I think you have to kind of have an, a grasp on the flow dynamics and it is a puzzle. And I think, I think an average radiologist probably doesn't, doesn't have that grasp. I don't think. Sure. 
Um, Randy, I see Dr. Moore has his hand up, so I'll pass it off to Randy. Eric, outstanding review. I really enjoyed that. Uh, um, it's been our experience over the years that, uh, and, and this has really been an evolving specialty, it's been our experience over the years that the more aggressive that we are earlier, the better our long-term results. And if you look at the literature, one of the challenges in interpreting the literature is trying to come up with a clear definition of what they mean by acute and subacute. Um, so for example, in the INSTEAD trial, as you know, the, the, they didn't treat the uh, dissection tear until almost 75 days after the initial uh, intervention. And what we found in our practice is that the earlier you treat these patients with, with their uh, you know, de descending thoracic fenestrations, the better the long-term result. So I just wanted your thoughts on, on sort of timing of intervention after the initial entry site seal. Uh, that's the first question. The second question, and this has really been sort of our experience that has evolved over the past 25 years, um, we, we are much more aggressive at the Peter Lougheed in terms of extending our covered stent all the way down to the celiac. I know that I and Scott have had this discussion at many, at many times. Um, and so I, 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 it's really sort of a two-pronged question. Number one, timing of when you want to go after these secondary tears and your thoughts on extent of coverage. Yeah, so the, the timing is a great question. And, you know, I agree. The, the traditional thinking is that the... Um, the best time is in the acute phase because that's when it's most amenable to remodeling. But as you know, I've got several cases and others to show where it does remodel in the chronic phase. But I, I do think it would be better to address them, you know, more in that acute subacute phase than leaving them. And I do think, as I understand this more, I agree. I think it, it, it makes sense to be more aggressive early on rather than watching them to become uh, complicated later on down the road. Um, so I, I think that is uh, definitely the, uh, a good approach. In terms of how aggressive, uh, in terms of distal extension, one of the limitations that we've seen is that, you know, a large majority of the patients that we see have been acute type A dissections. And so there's always been reluctance to extend distally because we don't have the option of CSF drains in the acute phase because that's just not compatible with doing open heart surgery and having CSF drains. So that's been the reluctance um, on that side of things. And so that's why when I look at all of these things, I, I do see the attractiveness of the stabilized approach because you can kind of have the best of both worlds. But we need to understand that it's safe and we're not going to cause ruptures because obviously that's bad. Um, anybody else, uh, any, any, any questions? Uh, if I don't see hands, what I will say uh, just for the group, um, Randy and I do go back and forth about that, that discussion. And, and I think the difference is in the cardiac literature with type A dissections, when we extend further, there is a higher spinal cord injury. Um, it is in the literature. Now on the other side, um, Dr. Moore and the VASA group deals with more type B dissections. And maybe it's just in Dr. Moore's hands or maybe it's in the VASA literature, but to their, to their credit, when they extend further in type Bs, um, they, they don't seem to have that spinal injury. And I don't know if it's a combination of the surgery and, and the bypass machine. And I, I don't know, but I do think there's certainly a, a different, different patients would be my opinion. Um, Randy, agree, you're nodding your head. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, uh, I, think, I think in the acute phase, uh, it's, it's a different kettle of fish, definitely. I mean, uh, uh, we have, uh, and I've been sort of staying on top of the stabilized literature, Eric, I have to tell you that that uh, balloon expanding uncovered stents through the perivisceral segment uh, makes me very afraid. Uh, I've had one very, very negative experience with that, with the on table basically extent for rupture as a result of that. And I, I frankly, uh, I, I'm not I'm not a big fan of that. I'm, I, I will use perivisceral uncovered stents if I'm really forced to. But for the most part, I've found the Knickerbocker is incredibly successful at stabilizing the perivisceral segment. And it's unusual to see persistent per perivisceral dilatation. If you address some of the downstream fenestrations, for example, through the viscerals by putting visceral stents in or through the iliac bifurcation, which is a common site of, of uh, re-entry from below. Um, one other just simple point, Eric, um, you mentioned or you demonstrated one case where you treated the outflow to the uh, false lumen perfusion by putting a carotid stent in, our approach has been a little more aggressive in that we'll always treat both the outflow and inflow if we can. And we have not been as successful treating just the outflow because that creates a closed loop uh, 
And we've seen in a number of cases where if we just treat the outflow, we see persistent false lumen dilatation. So I was encouraged to see that one successful case, but I wonder if you could just comment on that as well. Yeah, I, I actually think that in the vast majority with a careful look, if you, if you do not have a circuit, so if there is no longer outflow, and you have to look very carefully. And sometimes it takes many trials to find it, like that case I showed, we, we did struggle with that. So if you look very closely and sometimes it takes like a dynamic MRA, um, you, in those cases where you think it's a failure and it's not working, it's because there's an outflow somewhere that you're not appreciating. And there's a circuit that's facilitating that flow, but static blood thrombosis. And once it thrombosis, it gets smaller. That's, I think that's really consistent that I've seen over the years. Um, guys, uh, thank you, Dr. Herget. Uh, great, great talk, great discussion. And um, with that, I think we'll uh, we'll leave a few minutes early. Um, we have one more uh, aortic rounds in our in our for the year, and that's in a couple months. Um, the last Friday of I guess that'll be May. And our plan is to um, engage um, some of the basic science that's going on in, um, in aortic disease here um, at, in Calgary. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Herget. And we'll see you at our next rounds in two months. Thanks guys. Take care. Take care. <clears throat>